So this evening's discussion is going to be one of the foundations of Buddhism series, and we will be discussing the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right livelihood. This evening's topic is important as a foundation of Buddhism, apart from any other reason. That said, the pandemic has changed the way many people are thinking about work and their livelihood. And we, or we all see um, hiring now signs up everywhere. And we see urban areas, punches, and we see urban areas that are hollowed out uh, because people do not want to return to in-person working, preferring to work remotely. Um, did you hold it? Uh, the notion of productivity is turned on, is, seems to have been turned on its head. There's a lot being written about what is productivity, how do we define it in these days, and that sort of thing. Uh, and the work-life balance has become a prominent theme in articles and books. And all of this was in my mind when I was thinking about which of the noble eightfold truth have I should address this evening. Hence, this evening is right life. And when we start, we want to start with just a, a basic chart of Aryash and Gamara, Argaj, um, and so this is this is the chart of um, the Eightfold Noble Truth, and quite lively. There's three sections to the Eightfold Noble Truth to begin with. We have what are commonly referred to as ethical conduct, which is right speech, right action, right livelihood. Of course, this evening we're discussing uh, right livelihood. Then there is the mental discipline, which is right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Those, when we look at the mental discipline, we're often talking about um, meditation as well as, as other aspects. And when we look at wisdom, right understanding, right thought. Now, it's important to keep in mind um, that the foundational teaching, as it is in your handout, is the fourth of the Four Noble Truths. And these elements that you see before you, you can approach them in many different ways. And some people, it really starts typically with right thought and goes on to right understanding. Um, and right thought, very basically, is the Four Noble Truths you know, and, and how, how to approach that as an example. And so what's interesting about that is that we, we don't really approach these one through eight in a hierarchical fashion of let's try number one and we, we have that down and let's now go to number two and we have that down and now we go to number three which really intended to be to do all of them at one time as opposed to one complete it on to the next you're supposed to do these all together and it's really interesting because probably right thought may be one of the most difficult <laughs> in fact even though it's number one on the on the list so the list is the way it is, and it's given that way um, in, in Sutra. A little bit of back, background might be good also, is that the Eightfold, the Noble Eightfold Truth is enumerated by, by convention in the first sermon at Deer Park after Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment. Now, if you have been studying the Makashitan, you know that he gave other discourses and of course, in the Makashikan, the first discourse, the Avantan Sakra Sutra, but nobody understood it. So he went on and started at Deer Park with basic, what we think of today as the foundations of Buddhism. Um, however, from, so by convention, in the Theravada uh, path, we would start with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path as the beginning of his teaching. And of course, the Four Noble Truths, number four, is the Noble Eightfold Path. So that provides a little bit of context. 
and we all heard and read about the noble Eightfold Path to begin with, it is affirmative. We could substitute the term correct, skillful, or wise, as in skillful livelihood or wise livelihood. The Eightfold is simple. There are eight teachings to be used in everyday life. So this was really a concrete way of approaching Buddhist teaching. What's so noble about the noble path? Many people uh, have asked about that. And this, what is noble is it's intended as the conduct of the noble ones on the path to enlightenment. In other words, here's the path that one follows. He was addressing the quote unquote noble ones, those who were on the path to enlightenment. That doesn't mean that some noble folks weren't there. And noble isn't referring to people who might have been aristocracy or somewhere, something like that. It was really people, you know, one way of thinking about it is who was noble? Noble from a Mahayana perspective now, not from a Theravada perspective. Noble were those who had experienced Bodhicitta, those who had the glimmer of awakening as a possibility. And therefore, they were seeking awakening in their life. So, for the people who were not seeking awakening, for the people who really did not care very much about that, but they thought that Shakyamuni Buddha might have been entertaining, they were getting the, the teaching, but it wasn't really intended for them as much as it was for those who were actively seeking awakening. That's really what noble. So, that noble in that sense means people who are in the search of awakening are a kind of nobility or a kind of extraordinary person. Uh, in, in some ways to say, not the average Joe. You know, that's really what it's addressing. The underlying assumption to all the eight ways to, to proceed implies adherence to the five precepts, not killing, not stealing, not misusing sex, not lying and not amusing intoxicants. It also assumes one is committed to karuna, compassion, to prajna, wisdom, and to paya, skillful means, in all of one's activities. And by the way, that's the true meaning of mindfulness, is, is that one is applying compassion, wisdom, and skillful means in one's interactions with people. Next. Okay. Right livelihood positively stated. First and foremost, right livelihood is a way to earn a living without compromising the five lay precepts. The way of making a living that does no harm to others. These are the basic principles. Pretty straightforward and unambiguous. Most of us need to work to support ourselves for at least a good portion of our lives. How we do this has many dimensions. To expand on the proceeding, I'd like to state positive in a more personal fashion, and I'm going to quote Schumacher, which you have as part of your handout, because this to me is, to a very large extent, um, what is intended by right livelihood. And for those who don't know, E.F. Schumacher wrote, uh, what was the name of that, John? Um, well, Peter Scott, uh, now I can't remember the name of the writing. And he lived in Great Barrington, by the way. The Schumacher Institute is in Great Barrington. Um, anyway, it had to do with living simply. Traditional wisdom teaches that the function of work is at part threefold. One, to give a person a chance to utilize and develop their faculties. Two, to enable him to overcome his inborn egocentricity by joining with other people in a common task. And three, to bring forth the goods and services needed by us all for a decent existence. I think that that is really, in, in more contemporary language, that's where the uh, life, right livelihood was really intended. The spirit of right livelihood is to support oneself and one's family by a means that are not harmful, but helpful to others and oneself. This implies having some knowledge of the consequences of one's work, even for menial or humble services, service jobs, according to the value Workers have a right to fulfill their tasks with dignity. And it also means that right livelihood in this positive statement means that one is going to do the best in their job 
being careful to maintain the five precepts. And in so doing, is going to um, enable oneself and enable everyone else, and, and all people are working together. People sometimes, and I've really literally been asked this question, is it right livelihood to be a used car salesman? And the answer is yes, but you're not supposed to lie, so you might not sell many cars. <laughs> so it may, not, it may not be productive to be a, a used car salesman with, with right livelihood, but it's possible. Instead of saying this car was driven by a little old lady on Sundays um, for the lifetime of its existence, you have to say this was driven by a little old lady on Sundays and she gave it to her grandson who really beat it to hell. You know, <laughs> that probably would be what you'd have to do if you were a used car salesman and maintain the five precepts. But that sort of thing is really, I mean, we'll, we'll discuss it in, in right livelihood as importance in just a moment. but. Ultimately, that's what it was intended to mean. Um, and, and going back a little bit to the, um, to the origins of this, remember that these were, this was the, one of the first um, uh, presentations by Shakyamuni Buddha, it's discourses by Shakyamuni Buddha. And it was about 2,500 years ago. And what did livelihood mean? It had a different meaning than it has today. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Next, please. Go forward and set it backwards. Yep, got Thank it. You. Okay. Okay. Well, that's it. <laughs> so, right livelihood avoidance. And so we find the essence of right livelihood in this sutra, which is actually not a very long sutra. It's part of the Anga Chitara series. And basically, it says the lay follower should not engage in the five types of business, which five, and you can read them there. The commentary to the sutra means, it reveals, that business, anisha, which is the name of the sutra, means trading as a means of livelihood by a lay disciple, means by anyone who has taken the three refuges. That's, that's the bottom line, getting back to the notion of noble. One has taken the three refuges, one has achieved bodhicitta. And therefore, they're no by definition. Um, business in weapons means having made weapons, he sells them. Business in living beings means selling human beings, i.e., slavery. So think about this. This is really interesting because in 2,500 years ago, slavery was just a very common practice. And in India, Buddhism and Jainism at the same time were the first to say that one should not engage in slavery. That, they, that was 2,500 years ago. Only 2,600 years before America, and my dad, or 20, what, 2,300 years before America. Um, but the selling of human beings, slavery was a real problem when Buddhism got to China. And that was one of the difficulties of applying Buddhism in China, which because in China at the time, slave, slavery was not a trade the way we picture it in the Americas, but it was a very common. If, if one kingdom took over another kingdom, many of the people in the other kingdom would automatically become slaves to the emperor of the first of, of the second kingdom. So that was one of the things that really was a sticking point uh, in China in, in the early days. Um, business in flesh means raising pigs, deer, and so forth, and selling them. So raising animals to be consumed and selling them was one of the one of the right livelihood. Business in intoxicants means having made whatever kind of intoxicants. He, or she sells them. And this, of course, actually was interesting because it speaks directly to liquid intoxicants, equivalent to sake, rice wine, um, wine made out of other substances. Here. It doesn't address 
hallucinogens and things. I mean, ganja was very prevalent in India at that time, but it doesn't address things like ganja, which, which would be marijuana. Um, which I find really, really interesting. Now, later, some people made commentaries and said, well, if we're not supposed to drink uh, rice wine, how come we can have, you know, uh, marijuana? Uh, and the, there's commentary about just that sort of thing. But it was, it was interesting that that was the case. And then business in poisons means having made poisons, he sells them. And by poisons, um, there are different interpretations of what poisons were in this context but typically we would think of poisons specifically to kill people you know uh, not an uncommon thing at the time. in the ayurveda um, which is the indian medical system there are certain poisons that were that are normally given when one is ill uh, and they're recognized as poisons but they're supposed to be curative as a matter of fact we do the same thing today. Foxglove is is poisonous to human beings, but we use it to maintain heart rhythmicity, as an example, and it's a synthesized form today. But so business in poisons was was a thing. Uh, thus, one should neither engage in any of these businesses oneself, nor urge others to engage in them. So that was uh, an important aspect of this. This does not mean. That, and I want to maintain this here, we'll discuss it a little bit later. It doesn't mean that a butcher, a bartender, a cocktail waitress cannot be a Buddhist. What it means is, no, we'll get to that in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> let's, not, let's not go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 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 and now these ads. <laughs> Next week, we we'll week. discuss why can a bartender be right by Buddha, right? Okay. Next, please. So, what is the context regarding when and how right livelihood? Now, we, we talked about this being one of the earliest sutras, uh, and we have to keep in mind that as such, we're talking about 2,500 years ago, Shakyamuni Buddha said specifically about right livelihood, as well as the other, or, well, all of the Eightfold F, all the Noble Eightfold F, said, that they are an example of the middle way, avoiding the extremes of pleasure and self-torture. So initially this was specifically the middle way. Now I find it really interesting in context. One is not permitted by the prohibitions to manufacture or sell armaments, which in the day would have been swords, spears, today would be AR-15s or whatever, right? However, one of the right livelihoods was not, don't be a soldier, <laughs> don't, be, don't be a mercenary, <laughs> or whatever the, the case may be. Um, in the same way that it says one should not uh, raise animals for sale, but it doesn't say you can't be a butcher. It's saying that you are responsible if you raise the animals for sale, and some people then, in the early um, commentary, said, well, that means not slaughtering them either. But that may or may not be, because you don't know the way it reads. It, doesn't, it may imply that, but it doesn't say that. On the other hand, it doesn't say that a butcher can't be right livelihood. In other words, because that person didn't kill the animal, didn't raise the animal, etc. It's just packaging it or whatever for human consumption as an example. Um, so you find it, it becomes a little bit nuanced, which we're going to talk about uh, in a moment. Um, Takasaki makes the point that Ahimsa, not killing, originated with Jainism, which in turn influenced Brahmanic thought. And for instance, we think of the Brahmins today as vegetarians in India. That wasn't originally the case. Originally, Brahmins were the priests in the village, and they would actually sacrifice the animals and then divide up the animals for distribution to the village, that sort of thing. The idea of Brahmins being vegetarians was actually introduced from the Jains and from the early Buddhists, uh, as opposed to something that originated strictly within, within Hinduism. And it's become a, a distinctive feature today of Hinduism. But also, most of Indian thought 
So even how one um, approaches this, we can see how Buddhism had, had influenced uh, Indian thought along the way. The ten ways of good action, including the Noble Eightfold Path, represent the moral virtues of the ruler who would set an example for the subjects. That was what was taken from the Buddhist teachings. It was, here's the way that the ruler is going to act, and by so acting, is going to influence the, the followers, unfortunately, the serfs in the case of kingdoms. Uh, next, please. I, uh, by the way, uh, never mind. I was going to say something about it. Livelihood is nuanced, not proscriptive. And in the Buddhist teachings, and you can read this in the handout, what matters most is the intention. And this, I think, is, is one of the important points to be taken from this. Some occupations which may appear to be harmful may not be harmful when you consider the intention. And so an example that I give is a bartender. We were talking about bartenders uh, in this go and butchers. Drinking to excess is certainly an activity that can end up doing much harm. The loss of one's work and damage to the family as well as oneself. But this is only if it gets to an addictive level, that is the drinking. In moderation, it could be a form of entertainment, just like watching television. A bartender has no intention of creating an alcoholic any more than a TV table installer wants to create a TV watching addict, which might happen to, especially for those of us who are Yankees fans. <laughs> Addiction can be severe, and we go through withdrawal in November, and it lasts until yeah, April. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different story. So, killing of animals was also seen as a less than desirable occupation. It's the intention of the abattoir work to make an. It is not the intention of the abattoir work worker to make animals suffer is to provide food to people and the person raising and slaughtering animals for themselves and others may do this in a humane and natural way, or it can be done in industrial farming. And we can argue that industrial farming is not right livelihood, whereas more local, organic, et cetera, farming is more like right, like right livelihood, aside with abattoir practices aside. Um, a vegan may choose to eat or otherwise make use of animals, but the eating of vegetables alone does not mean that the animals were not killed in the production of the vegetables. Insecticides and other poisons are used to grow most commercial grains and vegetables, even on an organic farm. Animals die in the fields and sowing and harvesting. And the point that was made in early Buddhism, because early Buddhists, Nikaya Buddhism, were not vegetarian. They were required to eat whatever was given to them. When humans eat, and here's the intention, when humans eat, we should do so with the knowledge that other beings have been sacrificed for our needs and feel gratitude to those sentient beings and pay homage to them. We can't live our lives without the sacrifice of sentient beings and the 72 labors that bring us this food. I don't care what kind of diet you're on, unless you're on an Aryan, there are so-called Aryans that only live through the green new air. Something has to die in order for us to live, for human beings to live. The question comes out, and this was a question made by Shakyamuni Buddha. What is the gratitude that we have towards those that unintentionally, perhaps, gave their lives so that we might live, and to recognize that we are part of the cycle of life, and that all those sentient beings are also part of the cycle of life. And to have gratitude is an important aspect of this. And I think that that's in many cases where we feel, and I think that this is my editorial about this. And I think that that's where we fail the environment, because we don't show gratitude for what we've been given. Uh, naturally, we can, we can go out and, you know, Harvest from the fields, harvest from the wild fields, as well as what we've sown. But do we show gratitude? Do we demonstrate that we're really part of this existence? Or do we just use it as a resource? That's, I think, where there's a, a big um, 
what's the right term, um, separation between ourselves and the earth. Um, and and I, I think about the Native Americans who, if they were to shoot a deer, would immediately say a blessing on the deer and thank the deer for providing sustenance. That would be an example of being grateful to the environment. And for that matter, and I'm not being facetious when I say this, be grateful for the Brussels sprouts. You know, uh, how often do we just look at the food and we just down it with the sense of good, eat, <laughs> you know, and that's the end, that's the end of it. That's news. <laughs> Let's look at some widely held contemporary interpretations. <laughs> And the notion of right livelihood has morphed into several contemporary expressions that didn't exist 24, 2,500 years ago. And so I, I give here a number. You can look at some of the names of the people who renamed what right livelihood is. I mean, in their writings, they specifically state this is what is meant by right livelihood. It's, it's part of the, the total package, so to speak. Livelihoods taken on additional meanings and other terms are used to describe what was once a more straightforward definition. We no longer live in kingdoms that were simple, plan oriented polities. Industrialization, nation states, and now postmodern knowledge based economies have changed the ways we work and live. The five prohibitions are no longer as relevant as they once were, as the writers and practitioners of the west side of this slide indicate. The straightforward list of denied occupations are still pertinent for simple guidelines, but how we apply them becomes much more important. The principles underlying right livelihood as seen on the right are now much more applicable. In the end, we go back to the beginning. It is the affirmative notion of right livelihood first and foremost. Right livelihood is a way of living Earn, to earn a living without compromising the precepts is a way of making a living that does no harm to others. That means sentient beings, the earth itself. Many people participating in the gathering today are no longer gainfully employed. They're retired, for instance. If that's the case, your income may be coming partly or entirely from investments. If companies you are invested in are producing products or services, they're involved in things like arms manufacturing petroleum production, you have a moral obligation to find out if this is the case and change your investment profile because this is harming others and the earth. And, you know, for myself, you know, um, even though I may have, we do have, you know, our investments are in so-called ethical stocks and such, even then, and somebody's trying to get in, but even then, we have a situation where it's not consistent as to what these may be. Now, personally, do I think that we shouldn't invest in alcohol manufacturers? Well, I don't know. I, I think that probably most everyone here periodically has a beer or a gin and tonic or whatever it may be. I could be wrong, but many of us do. And so, I look at that and I think to myself, it's not the alcohol manufacturers themselves who have a problem with. And many people, if it's an industrial tobacco product, well, I might have a product problem with that because of cigarettes. Petroleum companies, I certainly have a problem with. Um, so we have something of an obligation. That's part of what right livelihood means today. It's not just what is your job, but how does this contribute to your living? In that, in that context, in other words, the point about now investments as just one example, but we could go to, into many other into many other examples. And most people, maybe to give an example, um, most people would agree that being a physician is an example of right livelihood. Everybody thinks that doctors are well intentioned. Well, let's not get into that. But we would, we would we would look at as someone who's a physician. Perhaps favorably thinking that that's a noble uh, livelihood. Um, however, if the physician is prescribing opioids indiscriminately without understanding the consequences, or treating patients in a way that increases her profit without thinking about what's best for the person, that's definitely not right livelihood. So the job itself is perfectly fine, it's not prohibited, 
However, how do you practice that job? And that becomes what's more important. What is the intention and how do we apply it? So it's not sufficient to check the boxes of what is, is or is not appropriate without exploring ultimately if there's harm being done. If so, to whom and how do we stop doing that? Thank you. And why don't you go to the next slide? Can you all hear the fan while I'm sitting here? I apologize if there's a lot of white noise. It's the only thing keeping my computer cool enough to keep the connection stable. So um, I love going back to foundational teachings. Um, they never cease to provide me and inform me in new ways. Um, there's a seemingly such a profundity to it, but um, getting to know the context and history and meaning um, of these teachings and how it can be applied, how it's experienced. The more we work and, and digest these teachings, the more we can apply them to our everyday experience. The more we bring um, our attention to the teachings like these, the more it's, it pervades our consciousness, our perspective, our being, and, and provides a focus on kindness, uh, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. This type of discussion, and in fact, I hope all of our discussions, help to bring our attention to how we conduct ourselves, how we choose to be in this life. Right Livelihoods Declarative helps us to bring our focused uh, attention to our everyday lives and, and how we choose to move through them. Teachings like the Eightfold Path provide us a schematic, offering us to the tools to learn from our experience and to adjust, change, and grow accordingly. We do all that throughout our lives anyway. This is just one way to help provide a framework, one that I personally trust. <laughs> it's been around for a while. It's purposefully tested the, uh, the trials of time. We, but it, it is all up to us to put these teachings into place in our lives so that we can experience how those teachings can impact our lives. Sometimes it can be really difficult to apply, um, to apply a lot of, the, of what we discuss, to live by those rules, to trust the teachings in, the, in that way. Maybe we only use the teachings when they're convenient. Who knows? But if we are purposeful about how we are living, by their very nature, those difficulties we face are the aspects that, that are the greatest source of adjustment, change, and growth. We must continually engage um, our focus on how to best be for all sentient beings. So, 